Hey, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I work at IE Business School Publishing, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Do you have something you'd like some help with? Ask our guests. Go to professorgame.com slash question and get your question answered in a future episode. Engagers, welcome to today's podcast. Today we have Karen. So Karen, are you prepared to engage? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> let's let's go. Let's do this. So Karen Sikama. I'm not sure if I got that right. Got that right. You did. Yes. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> so she's an experienced game gamification and experience designer. With her creative companies Living Story and Winter Twin Experience BV, she is designing experiences, location-based games, adventures for cultural heritage, and game-based learning for teams and businesses. Her aim is to create meaning in the world by connecting people to themselves, to others, and to great locations, and thus contribute to creating a sense of belonging, connection, and respect for yourself and others. She is also a professor at HKU Utrecht University of the Arts in Netherlands and Politecnico di Milano in Italy. So she's teaching on game design, gamification and entrepreneurship in the creative industries. Is there anything that we have left out of that intro, Karen, that you would like to comment on? I don't think so. No. <laughs> it complete. always sounds quite impressive if someone else reads it to you like this. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> You're very, very welcome. And thanks for, for taking your time to be today on Professor Game. And yeah, the first sure. thing that we would like to know, Karen, is what does a, a typical day with, with Karen look like? If there's such a thing or if, or if not a typical week or, or something around those, those things, just to get a feel of what your, your days or your, your life is like as a, as a designer. Yeah. Well, the days are, are very different, but um, uh, I, I think... Well, I, I could pick like uh, the the day of yesterday. Sure. I started yesterday with visiting a potential new client who would like to have uh, a game designed for a team building experience, but also to learn. They have uh, in their company many different small departments and they all kind of work on their own goals, but they want to... Have a uh, have everyone kind of also work on the broader goal of the company, which people tend to uh, leave out a little bit. So we try to brainstorm with them and think about what kind of game could you design around that in combination with a, a trainer who will. So we will uh, do a, a gamified start of the training, and then they will take over for a few training days, and then we will end. Uh, again, kind of tying it all together. Um, so that was the first part of my morning. Then I went back to my office, which is at the moment a huge botanical uh, garden um, greenhouse from the uh, beginning of the 20th century in which we are building an escape room which is not there yet. So we are brainstorming about that and also still working on the permits, etc., to make sure that uh, that actually can uh, can happen mm. there. And we also uh, had some, some discussions on a brainstorm for a, an escape room that we are doing for a client. And then we assembled all the stuff for a, a team game, which is a team building game that we are doing in the forest that we will play next week with 120 people and eight of my colleagues uh, in the forest uh, uh, around Utrecht. So, um, well, this is kind of, uh, it, it's not always the same type of day, of course, but it's, this <laughs> is that the, the type of things that we do in our company. So lots of brainstorming and lots of fun, it seems. Yeah, definitely. And, and also trying to, to kind of apply that, that fun to learning. In different contexts, so um, yeah. <laughs> so very exciting. A lot of escape rooms as well. 
And and in that sense, and all of those things that you've had, and all the things that you've mentioned that you're doing, I'm sure you're doing a fantastic job. But it's it's certainly not always rainbows and you know unicorns and everything's going beautiful. No, no. <laughs> we we also like to get into into the story of sort of the dark side, to speak in the terms of Star Wars, of the, the of a time that maybe did it didn't go so well at the first try, mm-hmm. and which you had some mm-hmm. sort of fail or a first attempt in learning. And of course, how that set set you up for for your current success or future success or what you learned from that experience that you're now applying to your daily practice. Yeah, I think the 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 best one or the worst actually. <laughs> the most exciting one. The, yes, well, in in hindsight, yes, at the moment not always, but um, is uh, when we were planning and designing a, a big location based game um, for kind of touristic and and cultural heritage purposes so it it, the the game is called lost in time um and it's played with an ipad uh, with which you go around in the city and actually the the story is that the there is a professor who has uh, designed a time machine and your ipad is is of course actually the time machine so you can travel into time and that way, experience the stories from history while playing mini games, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, but we uh, did that with using a lot of video, um, which is quite expensive. And actually, the game itself has become really, really nice. But what we 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 tried to find out during uh, making the game is is how you, how would you sell a game like this? And actually, the business model of selling that game was not thought through. Well, I wouldn't say at all, but uh, it could have had much more work, <laughs> which led actually led to investing a lot of time and money in in designing a beautiful game that has not been played by by a lot of people at all, and from which we actually lost. Uh, a lot of our investment so this is the well after this 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 all happened it took us a few years to realize that it would really not take off we really started thinking about what is actually the business model behind a game like this what should you do what should you not do should you design it as as your own project or do it for a client etc etc so in the years after we learned a lot about location-based games and uh, how you should use them and how you should design them. And actually, with our new location now, we have designed a new location-based game as well. Uh, but it's much, much, much cheaper uh, in, in the design. And we thought through the business model, etc., and the marketing before much better. So uh, this is one of the things that we learned a lot from. <laughs> so you had to think the whole thing through and i i think that's one of the things that maybe we we forget sometimes we get very excited about an idea we pursue it and i definitely invite you to get excited and pursue your your ideas however sometimes mm-hmm. it's also good to stop especially if it's if it's for a business if you're trying to make money out of something to think you know think through what are the consequences of the things that you're you're putting in there and maybe if it's only your 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 own time you just invest your own time or or some of the people in the company but as as Karen was mentioning, video can be very very expensive. So think through what are you you going to put in, what you can put in, yeah. How to experiment uh, as well, because maybe you can take action, short action, and see see what happens. What is the response? Uh, and I'm sure Karen has learned all of these things uh, and much more. We learned a lot about uh, about kind of the, the the design thinking method and and about much better. Uh, becoming much better in kind of iterative design so uh, designing in short cycles and testing what you did and making sure that people actually really like what you do and listening even much much better to the people that you are designing for because we actually in that case pursued really our own passion and our own idea which I think you really should always do but it has to be combined somehow especially when when you want, want to make a business out of it with really listening to your clients and customers and see what they like and what they don't like and and in what way it can become a success um so the combination with our own passion and and kind of what's in the market out there there's somewhere a touching point that you really need to find think of your players 
we always say this, but think of your players. That yeah, could be your students. Different. It could be your clients. It could be whatever you're, you, the, the people that are doing this. It's not the same to design a game for a second grade student than for a university student. It's not the same. There are different types of players. They have different motivations. They have different levels of knowledge. So yeah. just think about them. Don't consider what they want, what they're motivated by, and that's that's going to lead certainly your your gamification design. And and taking a, a hundred and eighty degree spin on, on on this question, Karen, what would you say is something a, a some big challenge that you actually faced and and you know faced and solved using maybe gamification, game design, one of your approaches? And and we would love if that experience as well can, comes from your from your education side. If not, we can also go for the client. But education is always our, our primary interest. I think uh, there, there, there is a, a case from my, actually my personal experience as well, which was in a period that was really hectic and really I, I tried to do a dozen things at the same time. And this, uh, I, in the end, kind of helped solving by designing my own kind of planning game, which was really nice because it made a lot of fun uh, for me in, in this hectic, uh, chaotic days. This is uh, on the one side, uh, uh, an example that I thought of. And on the other hand, um, I'm, uh, I'm a designer, but also owner of my own company, so an entrepreneur. Uh, and that's why I teach also about entrepreneurship in the creative industries. And one of the things that, I, that was kind of challenging for me is, is indeed how to kind of design your lessons around that within a university context because one of the things that is most important to me is as an entrepreneur is that you le learn by doing and you learn by experiencing and this is actually one of the things that you do in in games and gamification as well so um, i started thinking about that when i was teaching about entrepreneurship and in the end it led to a, a game about entrepreneurship which I designed together with an innovation consultant and also use now in my entrepreneurship courses. And actually, I, I went with that game last week to uh, the Business Learning Games Conference in Lisbon as a finalist. So uh, from the, the thinking about teaching about entrepreneurship, uh, uh, we designed a really nice game, I think. Nice. That sounds very exciting. What can, can you give us a few clues of what the game looks like? Yeah, definitely. It it is a, a type of board game which looks a little bit. Uh, it has um, kind of tiles like the Carcassonne uh, game, the board game. And what we actually tried to do was a, a lot of uh, games about entrepreneurship are actually in the kind of narrative like you have a business and you have to set up this business. And we, uh, I really wanted to kind of take it out from this more obvious uh, way of thinking. So the game is called Adventure. And what you actually do with your team is go on an exploration of a, of a new uh, continent, which has been discovered. And you go on this travel with your team. You first have to, to um, select a mission together and you have to select uh, your own character based on entrepreneurship skills, which are from a research by a Dutch uh, researcher. And then during your kind of travels in this game, you discover that when your team is really diverse, for example, you get more success than when you have a team that is all the same people, um, which are really is one of the things that we wanted to put in the game because well especially young startup teams they tend to when they hire other people they tend to hire people that look like them because they like them the most and they brainstorm <laughs> with them really really well um, and they don't realize that they should hire someone who's completely different from them because then you have more skills in your team and you can do more stuff basically so um uh, this we try to translate in a team of discoverers and explorers in this game. 
Very, very interesting, Karen. That's super, super interesting as an initiative. And I also love the fact that it's not digital. So you, you open the possibilities to a, to a board game. And, yes. and that's actually fantastic. And in that sense, Karen, you were explaining us how this in game in particular works. But when you approach a problem, a class, whatever whatever it is that you, you want to, to talk about in this, in this question. But when you, you face any of these problems that you want to solve or any of these situations that you want to gamify or create a game design, mm -hmm. how, do you have any sort of process that you follow or any certain steps or key things that you take into account when you design these experiences? Yeah, actually, uh, based on on our process, I am in the I am in the process myself of of kind of designing the the model for what we actually do. We always start with, especially when it's in a learning context, with really trying to figure out either if it's my own class or a client or 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 a, another teacher. Um, what is actually the learning goal? So what do you really want to learn from this game? And what do you want people to actually do or experience or discover? And uh, when that is clear, then for us, the next step is almost always finding some kind of narrative or a kind of epic story theme to uh, design the game in. So uh, in this adventure example, It's the narrative of a discovery expedition. You can have the narrative of, uh, I don't know, uh, Robin Hood who is saving a forest or it can be actually anything. Um, but this is really helping me design the game in a way that everything fits together and, and you really get into the experience of the game quite quickly. And it f from the narrative, the, the kind of game goals will more or less automatically follow and then we really think about things like how do we motivate players what kind of actions are they going to perform uh, what are the different player types that are most common in this group and how are they motivated how are we making sure that there is a social dimension because I'm really convinced that that games and gamification is about it's a, of course about people and about people connecting to themselves and connecting to to each other and learning from each other so this is one of the the most important parts for for, for designing our games and of course thinking about how will we make sure that it's fun etc um, and then when we are done we really have a look at how do, does the game transfer back into the learning goals. So making sure that it's not only a fun game to do for one afternoon or a few days or whatever, but also that there is some learning aspect which connects to, which connects back to real life and what you actually want to learn uh, for your class or your colleagues or your company. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for your, for your process, Karen. Thank you. Engagers, quick break from this interview. If you love what gamification can achieve, then you will love going to a gamification conference. And this year, we got a 10% discount for the Engagers to assist to Gamification Europe 2018 in Amsterdam. All you have to do is get your tickets for the conference at professorgame.com slash gamification Europe. That's our affiliate link. It was an incredible experience in 2017 full of chances to learn and interact with the top experts. If you think you want to make it, get your tickets sooner rather than later. Their prices are only going up and tickets might run out. So click pause and go to professorgame.com slash gamification Europe to get your tickets discounted today and also support Professor Game. So now, Karen, we are going to go into this sort of the second part of this interview in, in which we change a bit. We shift slightly the way that we're asking the questions, the way you, the way you format what we're looking for. And instead of going for stories, we're going actually for maybe a bit more straightforward answers in, in this in this section. And, and the first you thing... You want me to talk less? No, no, it's not about... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I it's not just about talking less. It's it's probably it's more... And, and you, you love narrative and, and, and storytelling and that's... And that's fantastic. And that's a technique that we use very much and especially for, for the first section. But here, maybe it's less about the story and more about what you think about these, mm -hmm. these different items. So the first one is if there's anything that you feel um, that is a, sort of maybe a best practice or something that any, any gamification project or, or game-based learning project could, could, could benefit from. 
I think, as you said before um, uh, already, that for me it's at, at the start thinking less about making it digital and more about what is actually the goals that you have and the behavior that you want to see in people when they play the game. And more often than not, this can actually be achieved by doing something non-digital, which also often um, has people connect more to each other because they are actually playing a physical game together. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's true. And keeping that as a perspective as well, that you can, that not everything is digital. And as well, many, many professors, many teachers out there might be sometimes afraid when they hear gamification and they think, oh, this whole digital adventure and all this programming, zeros and ones, so yeah. complex, so complicated. And, and it can be a fear that gets you stuck. So so I, I love that comment. I think it's a very, very useful way of, of seeing it as well. Thank you. And it's actually much cheaper uh, as yeah. well, uh, <laughs> more often than not. Especially if you're trying to do your homemade uh, things and it's not like you have a studio or you have, you know, your own company or something similar. If it's if it's more of a homely thing, that is what the situation of most educators in general. Uh, it's certainly easier to achieve in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Karen, what would you say is your favorite game? Maybe it could be current or from, you know, from all history of games. What would you say is, is, is your favorite? I have to say it's, it is actually a digital game, uh, but it's Myst. Myst. Which is a bit old already. <laughs> but it's one of the first games that I, uh, that I played on the PC. The, the other day we were, we were talking with, uh, you probably know him, Michiel van Junen. Oh, yeah. He said the same, I'm <laughs> <Yes>. sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. Part of the experience was uh, us playing together. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I, I had the CD-ROM in my hands. That, that's uh, a, 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 a quick clue into how old it could be. I had the CD-ROM <laughs> in my hands, and for some, whatever reason, I couldn't play it in my PC and, and lost the chance of playing the Mist in its time. So I, mean, I, I promised Michiel I would try to, <laughs> to play it uh, as soon as I could, but life has been a bit crazy in these these last months so <laughs> hopefully I'll, I'll get a chance it even on the ipad nowadays yes yes that's true that's true no, not too many excuses except for <laughs> lack of time <laughs> no. no but i understand that one uh, uh really well so <laughs> it's an acute uh problem that we tend to suffer as humans <laughs> So, Karen, in that same sense, is there is there anybody we we just talked about Michiel, but it, it, who was uh, relatively recently on the podcast? Is there anybody that you would like to listen to in an interview like this one in Professor Game? I'm I'm a big fan of Jane McGonagall. Yes, Jane McGonagall. Reality is broken. Yes, definitely. <laughs> she is definitely a a must listen to, a must read, and definitely. we certainly hope to have her in the show soon enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will definitely listen then. <laughs> We, we hope you do. We hope I you listen do. to the other podcasts as well, of course, but uh, this one I would <laughs> never miss. Top of the list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in that same sense, uh, Karen, is there is there is there a book that you recommend to to the audience, to the engagers? Well, yeah. I, well, it, it's also her book, uh, "Reality Is Broken," that I always recommend, and I also really like the books "Drive," which is about Daniel Pink, right? Yeah, 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 about uh, types of motivation uh, and the book Flow as well from Chichet Mihai. Yes, indeed. W would you? Because I, I was I was thinking of the books that you're recommending, and I guess that maybe a, a, more of a gateway book, like the a first book to read, would perhaps be the Jane McGonagall's book, and then yeah, go into the others, right? Yeah, yeah. But I think when you are into game-based learning, then the other two are. I mean, they're less about games and gamification, perhaps, but more about how to motivate people. And, and, and it's also really applicable to learning, I think. It's fundamental. We have to think of our, of our students, of our learners, whomever they might be. We have to think of them. And, and these books are fantastic ways to uncover what could be behind their motivations. Yeah, which is definitely. The core of games and game, gamification and all these techniques we talk about. I think it's one of the things that in learning could be applied much more and needs to be, needs to be yeah. as well yeah, yeah i agree yeah. <laughs> karen what would you say is your superpower when when creating these experiences or these any of these experiences that you've been talking about your sweet spot i think for me it's the it, it's bringing together but uh, the people who are playing a game 
and the game itself and the location where you are. And because I really believe that the location is is a, a, a very nice addition to playing a game. Yes. So that's why we also uh, design for cultural heritage sites, etc. And then in that sense, when you when when we bring this these three parts together, I think the games that we design really make people connect and also give them some kind of sense of belonging somehow. And that's why location-based games are are starting to be a thing. It's not only Pokemon Go, but there's many things going on in in that space. And that that especially in in what was mentioned right now by by Karen, that there's many possibilities to explore in in this space. Yeah, definitely. Karen, now we're going to go into a slightly, maybe we could say it's a gamified question in this in this podcast. And it's mm-hmm. because we don't know what the question is that is going to come up. I did take a look at your profile to make sure that we don't ask you something that is completely out of, you know, right field and you don't know it's coming. But you will listen to this for the first time. So yeah. this is the question of a, well, it, actually, I think it fits in pretty well to what we've been talking about into your profile in particular. So this this person says, I'm a business school professor and I haven't used gamification before, but I have been thinking of trying an escape room with my students to see how yeah. it goes. Hmm, interesting. Wonderful. I'd like to test their reactions. I'm, I'm doubting because they might feel gamification is something more for kids and I teach in graduate school. Okay, so here are the doubts. How can I know if this is for me? What would be my first steps? I, th- I think it's a really good idea. I think one of the first things is it's important to realize is that I think the the people who are playing escape rooms are generally in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So in that sense, this is definitely not something for kids per se. And in terms of what to do is, I think, just try. I think with gamification and games, you never learn uh, when you are not trying. So you can talk about it a lot. You can ask people, <laughs> would you like like to play a game? But they actually don't know until they do because then they experience and it's really about uh, learning by doing both for the students and in this case, I think, uh, the professor. So what I, what I would do is try to see, um, well, or play some escape rooms yourself and try to see what you really like and, and what what is the type of things that you think can be uh, applied to what you want to learn your students um, and then set up something small and, and experiment and see what they think. I think students are really into kind of also helping you to set something like this um, to make it work. Yeah, the motivation of the students and their ownership over yeah. something which they have been involved is certainly Definitely. going to be a lot higher. And actually what I also uh, what I've been doing before is having the class design an escape room mm, for their learning. Uh, so so instead of designing it yourself, have the the students design it for each other, which is I mean there's great results in that because they are uh, they they get really motivated if they design something that someone else will play and then they give feedback to each other, which is, and then it's actually much easier for yourself because you don't have to do a lot. <laughs> well, but the facilitation of these kinds of things is not as as easy as it maybe looks no, no, looks no, no, like from the other side. <laughs> that's definitely true. But in terms of of designing, I mean, I yeah. I, I understand that that thinking about oh i i have to design an escape room can be can feel like a bit of a daunting task while um facilitating a group of students to to do something is is something that's much more close to you as a professor i think and then you you can learn yourself so taking seeing what others um what the students design can help you de- design it better for the next year or something those are great recommendations, Karen. I uh, Just to maybe sum it up, I would say the first thing that you said is, is of course, go to a few escape rooms <laughs> and experience yeah. it yourself. See what you like, what you don't like. And have fun with them. Definitely have a lot of fun. <laughs> Analyze them, but have fun in them because otherwise you don't know what will be fun, at least for you. Then uh, the other recommendation I, I, I brought from your what you were saying is certainly to, to consider maybe the possibility of not designing it yourself, but get the students involved, get them to, to test out things 
things and to check out how it how it goes and maybe you can get some new ideas to do it in the next period in the next semester in the next year the next class maybe even if if it's with the same students so so that could be an interesting experience especially for for creative subjects that you might be you might be teaching like like karen and finally, well, of course, you have to test it. You have to go out and, and do that thing and let them know that you're experimenting is something that I would add. And they will take, in general, I, I, we've, the experience that we've gathered, especially from other guests as well, is that when you are open about these kinds of things and saying that you're testing this out to, to, you know, to help them in, in their learning, to help them have more fun, they tend to be more lenient if things don't go exactly as you were planning and they're not perfect. They can be a lot more forgiving if, you, if you're transparent with your intentions. Yeah, definitely. And, and in my experience, then when when you ask afterwards for for feedback and see what and and also on not only about on on the um, the design of the game but also about the learning content then surprisingly in in that feedback session uh, they tend to learn a lot still because then they are really thinking about okay this were the learning goals this this is what we were supposed to learn did we actually learn this yeah we did because this and this and that so so it's actually also a, a kind of a step for students to kind of work on the learning content again so in my experience this is often the kind of session in which a lot of learning still takes place yeah Thanks for all those examples, all those things that we could be using if we're going to be designing an, an escape room in the future or if, or if we're considering it even to do such a thing. Yeah. So finally, Karen, is there any final piece of advice you would like to, uh, maybe more general than the, than the escape room, but any final piece of advice you would like to leave the engagers with? Well, I think that what's important is to kind of try and think in a playful way instead of wanting to design from scratch something intricate and and complex but just try out different ways of of getting getting things more playful to begin with and i actually i really like the 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 what's in the book by Jessie Shell uh, who says well g- game design is really a, a very can be very a complex and and also very interesting area to uh, but but you have to start somewhere a- any one of us started by at one point saying i'm a game designer even though it's <laughs> not even something that you really feel inside but being a game designer really means that you have to test and experiment and just go out and and do stuff um and which i uh, set me also really on that path thinking okay well i actually am a game designer um, and by you, you, you only learn by doing this yourself and gaining experience. So you have to just start somewhere and then learning by doing yourself, really. Yeah, as, I, as uh, I've mentioned him a few times before in this podcast, John Lee Dumas, I don't know if you've heard his podcast. He says, if you want to be a podcaster, do a podcast. If you want to be a game yeah. designer, do game design. Exactly. So if you want to be, do. That's that's and a great start. advice. <laughs> and a- I think it helps if you uh, find people around you that you can brainstorm with and test some stuff. Uh, don't, don't, uh, I mean, if you sit by yourself at your table trying to design a game, then sometimes it can be a bit hard. But uh, in my experience, when you find someone that you can talk to for even only 10 minutes then the creative process goes much faster and it's also much more fun definitely the social experience as in gamification yeah Yeah. so karen we arrived to what we could call the plug zone (laughs) can you let us know how can we connect with you what's what's your with your web page um i don't know any 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 place where we can connect with you know more about the work that you're doing just let us know sure well, um, anyone who is ever in the Netherlands is more than welcome to uh, visit us in, in a, a small town called Baren, um, in a beautiful in this beautiful cultural heritage site, um, the Winter Town. Um, but if you are not in the neighborhood, you can always find us at uh, the website livingstory.nl and email me at karen at livingstory.nl. Fantastic. Thank you very much for leaving all those details and for letting us know that we can also visit you in that beautiful <laughs> town. I yeah. would love to, to do that if I have any opportunity in the future. 
However, Karen, today and Engagers, uh, we've had a wonderful time. We've had a lot of experiences from Karen, a lot of advice, very, very useful to, to take out there and to use it, you know, tomorrow. But now it's regretfully, and for now, time to say it's a game over. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to you, Karen. Thank you. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. How, how are you listening to this podcast? If it's through a podcasting app, have you subscribed and rated this podcast? Please do so. That way we can reach more engagers like you to achieve our mission of making learning amazing. If you want more instructions, go to professorgame.com slash iTunes. Before you go on to your next mission, would you like to know how Chris Avilis changes the rules of the game in gamification? Then subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there. Hey, we have an Easter egg over here. So I just wanted to give you a quick reminder that Karen is going to be in Gamification Europe. So she will be very soon in Amsterdam, where I'll be at as well. So if, again, if you want to be there, remember that you can use the link professorgame.com slash gamificationeurope, and we will meet over there in Amsterdam. See you there.